Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. And we seem to be having a week of recurring guest stars on the channel. Yesterday we had Aurorix 78 doing light tanks again, and today it's the return of Below Average Potato in a brand new ship, the all-singing, all-dancing USS Illinois. We'll talk about the ship itself in a moment. I mean, it's an interesting ship. I don't know if I'd be confident enough to go so far as to say it's a good ship, but it's definitely not bad, but yeah, anyway, we'll get on to that. For the moment, I want to talk about an issue with the matchmaking. I know, do attempt to contain your shock and horror. Uh, the World of Warships matchmaker has never really been without its issues. I mean, it attempts to provide the illusion of balanced teams. If one team has a carrier, the other team has a carrier. If one team has four battleships, the other team has four battleships, and so on and so on. But in particular when it comes to the cruisers, while it will provide the same number of cruisers on each team, it doesn't address the capabilities that those individual cruisers have. Primarily here we're talking about things like radar cruisers. And we can see a prime example of that right here, where the enemy team has one radar cruiser in the shape of the Tier 8 Soviet Talon, and Below Average Potatoes team doesn't have any. Although, I've seen worse. I've seen games where there have been two radar cruisers. Why is that a problem, Jingles? One for each team. Well, yep, but dividing two by two was apparently a mathematical equation way beyond the capabilities of the World of Warships matchmaker, because they usually put them both on the same team. Two radar cruisers, two teams. One on each? Nah. Too much effort. Stick them both on the same team. So that's kind of bad, and it's a problem that's existed with the matchmaker since, well, forever. And one which Wargaming have steadfastly refused to acknowledge. And in fact, instead of making it better, they've actually made it worse. Not once, but twice. Wargaming recently introduced a whole bunch of super ships, which are effectively tier 11s, and the matchmaker doesn't give them any kind of consideration. So it's not unusual, for example, to see an Annapolis on one team and no corresponding super ship on the other team. But then things got even worse with the introduction of hybrids, because while there are no carriers in this game, actually there are. There are two carriers on the enemy team. You wouldn't know just by looking at the team lists, but two of the battleships on the enemy team, the Delaware and the Nebraska, are hybrid battleship carriers. So not only does the enemy team have radar, and below average Potatoes team doesn't, they've also got air spotting. Twice. And below average Potatoes team doesn't. But that shouldn't be too much of a problem for below average potato ship, the all singing, all dancing USS Illinois, which is basically an Iowa. A ship that already boasts formidable anti aircraft firepower. And among the differences between the Iowa and the Illinois, and there are some big differences by the way, you may have noticed one of them already, but one that you probably haven't yet noticed is that the Illinois actually gets improved anti aircraft defences over that of the Iowa, which are already pretty impressive to begin with. And those aren't even two real carriers on the enemy team. They're hybrids. Yeah, we're going to see how much difference this improved AA makes. <laughs> but now onto the major difference between the Iowa and the Illinois. You might have noticed the absurd rate of fire of these battleship guns. That's because they're not battleship guns. These are heavy cruiser guns. Specifically, they're the 8-inch auto-loading heavy cruiser guns that you find on the Tier 10 USS Des Moines and the, funnily enough, we just mentioned it, super ship Tier 11 USS Annapolis. Below average potato there, scoring his first kill against the enemy Massachusetts. Ooh, I think he's probably going to take one of those torpedoes, that's unfortunate. And it looks like, yep, it was a big one, 17,000 damage, ouch. That suggests the presence of one of the enemy destroyers, probably the Yugamo. Gee, if only the team had a radar. Oh, there he is. Why did he get himself detected? Actually, that probably means he's launched some more torpedoes between those two islands, but that's fine. They would have a very narrow firing arc. You can easily avoid them by just taking a left turn, like this. Shots out at the Algerine. And sure enough, there are the torpedoes. 
While these are effectively the same guns, the same auto-loading 8-inch heavy cruiser guns that you get on the Des Moines and the Annapolis, the rate of fire is, for some bizarre reason, slower. Oh, here come the Delaware's dive bombers. He's actually managed to shoot one of them down. With his improved... <laughs> oh, and he's got the, uh, the Algerie. That's kill number two. Don't worry, we're going to be seeing more of the Delaware and later the Nebraska too. Well, actually, we won't because then we'd have an opportunity to sink them, but we're going to be seeing their aircraft. Smart move here, by the way, staying behind this island rather than pushing out to chase down that Yugamo. Because the Yugamo has a torpedo reload booster, and there could be torpedoes coming around the side of that island as well. Plus, he took a lot of damage there, and uh, he's taken the opportunity to stop and lick his wounds. Let's talk a bit more about these guns, by the way. Oh, actually, no. No, we'll, again, we'll cover that in a moment. First, we need to talk about the team's other destroyer, aside from the Kitakazi that Below Average Potato is divisioned up with, the Benson, who just died all alone up in Cap Circle Alpha. He's been bitching about the battleships and cruisers on this team the entire game in chat. And then decided to charge into Cap Circle Alpha which had radar coverage from the Talon, gee, if only both teams had radar, found himself in a gunfight with a flint and a Kitakazi at point-blank range. And a flint, for those of you who aren't aware of that ship's capabilities, is basically two gearings bolted together, so <laughs> the Benson didn't last long. And he's blaming all the battleships and cruisers for it. Because of course he is. I mean... Taking responsibility for your own fuck-ups is so 20th century. Uh, anyway. So, the guns. Yeah, I keep threatening to talk about the guns on this thing. It may seem like a weakness to have heavy cruiser guns on a battleship, and to a large degree I suppose it is. Oh crap, here come the dive bombers again. Yeah, that's alright actually, they're not going for him. It looks like it's actually going for the Sejong, which is basically an American World War II AA cruiser. I mean, more fool. The carrier, that thing has 70 anti-aircraft guns, and it's right next to another cruiser, so this should be fine. Didn't really seem to make much difference, did it? <laughs> well, what were you expecting? Right, anyway, yes, these guns. I promise I'm going to focus, I'm going to talk about these guns. So, 8-inch auto-loading heavy cruiser guns on the hull of an Iowa. No 16-inch guns here, just 12 8-inch guns. Now, there are good things and bad things about this. The bad things, obviously, being that they're not 16-inch guns. Also, for some bizarre reason, while they're still among the fastest-firing heavy cruiser guns in the game, they have a slower rate of fire than the same guns found on the Des Moines at Tier 10 and the Annapolis, arguably, at Tier 11. Despite being mounted in a battleship, which has way more space for things like ammunition hoists. I don't know, maybe it's something to do with the fact that this is tier 9. Or possibly the fact that these guns are arranged 4 per turret rather than 3 per turret. The configuration that you find on the Des Moines and the Annapolis. Oof, he took a big hit there. Oh, we dished out a big hit to the Yamono as well though. No cruiser wants to be sailing broadside to these guns. Just don't do it. So, we've covered the bad things about these guns. Slower reload than you'd expect, and way, way lower caliber than you'd expect on a battleship. But that's the Illinois' main selling point. Ooh, more torpedoes. Look at that. What about the good things? Well, the armor-piercing shells, which are already impressive. American Super Heavy 8-inch armor-piercing shells. Very, very nice. But these ones get improved armor-piercing penetration angles. And the fact that they are only 8-inch guns means that the Illinois enjoys the lowest smoke firing penalty range of any battleship in the game. You can get closer, and this of course is why he's divisioned up with the Kitakazi and has been taken advantage of the Kitakazi's smoke screen. And oh, here come those dive bombers again, but that's all right. Priority AA sector up. Makes no difference whatsoever. <laughs> it's absolutely bitch slapped. Double fire. Yeah, shoots none of them down. Improved anti-aircraft defences over the already impressive Iowa. My fat ass. Methinks below average potato is going to have to chill out a bit here. It'd be nice if the enemy could all come at him around the corner of this island one at a time so he can fight them one at a time. And he is in an aisle. Oh god, here they come again. Don't worry, priority AA sectors up. And the Kitakazis basically 
a dual-purpose AA destroyer, and a Kansas, and a Zeton, and a New Orleans, and, well, shot some of them down, but they still managed to get their strike off, because of course they did. The other good thing about the Illinois, by the way, because I'm drawing a lot of comparisons here against the Des Moines and the Annapolis, because they have the same guns, but what the Illinois can do that the Des Moines and the Annapolis cannot, because it is an Iowa hull, is this. Angle up around a corner and tank incoming 16-inch armor-piercing shells, something that very few cruisers can do. The enemy Iowa is being very, very, let's be generous and call it brave here. Broadsiding on to this much armor-piercing. I mean, it's not 16-inch armor-piercing, but it's, it's still gonna hurt. The range is probably a little too far for him to be citadeled by 8-inch armor-piercing, but he's still taking large chunks of armor-piercing penetrating damage, and with the rate of fire of this thing, because the adrenaline rush skill is definitely in effect, I mean, that adds up very, very quickly. The Iowa, however, at least has the excuse that he's a battleship and he's got some armor. Fat lot of good that armor's doing him. Oh, here come the dive bombers. He's put up his priority AA sector, probably more out of habit than any hope that it's actually going to do anything. And while the Iowa, who was broadside and everybody, survived to tell the tale because he's a battleship, the Flint has no such excuse. Shots out, armor piercing, shitty death. <laughs> There's the Yugamo. High explosive reloaded, Flint down, shots out. Main battery reload reduced. I don't think it's going to help. He's got the Yugamo, there's the double strike, there are the torpedoes, and by some miracle he only eats one. Oh, that was the Kraken Unleashed as well, by the way. Now he just has to survive the next five seconds to get his damage repair party back up and hope that, yep, thank you team. <laughs> one deep water torpedo and then finished off by the mines. Thank you very much. That German cruiser captain and here come the dive bombs again. <laughs> and, uh, again, more through habit than any hope that it's actually going to do anything. Priority AA sector up. Improved AA over the already impressive Iowa made no difference whatsoever. Didn't shoot a single aircraft down. He was just lucky that they missed because that is the counterplay in World of Warships to getting pounced on by a carrier. Hope that they're shit or just unlucky and they miss. Your AA, as we have demonstrated countless times, doesn't do shit. You see, the actual purpose of anti-aircraft guns on surface ships in this game is not to defend your ship against air attack. Because they don't defend your ship against air attack. What they do is make you feel slightly better about being subjected to constant air attack by throwing you a bone in the shape of the occasional aircraft shot down. Controversial opinion, I'm sure, but I challenge you to prove me wrong. Oh, I've just realised another good thing. Oh, hang on a second, he's right. Oh, yeah, he was waiting for that Talon, wasn't he? That's why he was scanning the horizon. Armour piercing loaded, Talon firing high explosive because, you know, it's an Iowa. Bow in. Your AP's going to do basically nothing. But, um, yeah, sailing broad. If you knew he was there and you had the high explosive preloaded and you radared him and you're in a cruiser, why are you broadsiding? Pff, fine, we'll take it. Kill number six. Things are looking pretty good. I mean, they have a substantial points lead, mostly thanks to below average potato being here in Cap Circle Bravo and preventing the enemy team from flanking around and doing anything about the two caps that they don't hold. And they technically also have a numbers advantage with five ships surviving against four enemies. And the mines on the team out there on the flank is about to improve that numbers advantage by taking out yet another enemy ship, although the Jean Bart pushing alone up into Cap Circle Alpha appears to be trying his level best to give that numbers advantage, well, not back to the enemy team, there it is. <laughs> but it's only a technical numbers advantage, because while it may look on paper as if it's four against three, with the enemy team only having three battleships, the enemy team actually has three battleships and two aircraft carriers. Below average potato, having to be very, very careful here, because while he can tank 16-inch armor-piercing shells on his nose, he cannot tank 18-inch armor-piercing shells on his nose. So he took advantage of the Musashi over there being distracted in order to pop out and take a couple of shots. Oh, the Musashi's taken out the Minnesota, and once again, here come the fun police to spoil everybody's fun. And the anti-aircraft guns are doing... absolutely nothing. Not a single aircraft shot down. Here they come, no shits given, bombs away. 
Oh wait, no, one. After it had dropped its bonds. Tell me below average potato, how good does it feel to have improved anti-aircraft defences? <laughs> Over that of the Iowa. Yeah. Let's not forget the Kitakaze was there as well, with its dual-purpose 100mm guns. Kitakaze's gotten its torpedoes away. The downside with it, I mean the Kitakaze is a great gunboat, but it's a limited effectiveness as a torpedo boat. It only has one launcher, but it does have a reload booster, which he has used. Oh, I think you might have misjudged your capability to duck back into cover there below average, but yep, he's dead. Shit. Still, six kills. He's got fires burning on the Masashi. Damage is continuing to tick. No, Masashi's damage controlled it. He was probably, yeah, he probably had floods from the multiple torpedo hits as well. So 195,000 damage is all you're going to get. And now it is two versus three. And under normal circumstances... When you've got a cruiser and a destroyer against three battleships, my money's on the cruiser and the destroyer, mostly the destroyer. But it's not a cruiser and destroyer against three battleships. It's a cruiser and a destroyer against three battleships and two aircraft carriers. And despite the loss of the Illinois, the team are way ahead on point. They just have to survive for long enough, probably less than a minute, for the points counter to tick over a thousand and they win. And ordinarily, with a cruiser and a destroyer, that would be easy. <laughs> you just turn around and run. Battleships are never going to catch you, and they're never going to outspot you. But this isn't ordinarily, is it? Because it's not three battleships. Well, it's only two now. They've managed to sink the Nebraska. But it's still two battleships and an aircraft carrier. <laughs> so, <laughs> come on, guys. 992 points. Just turn around and run the hell away. And that is exactly what they're doing. And... Any second now, there it is. A win. Against all of the odds, by the way. Because not only did they have no radar, the enemy team had two carriers. And they didn't. World of Warships matchmaker. Working as intended. My congratulations, of course, to Below Average Potato, but also Grudge Zed, the Kitakaze that he was divisioned up with, and the Captain of the Mines as well, Hawaiian Gunner who pulled off some key kills at crucial moments and without whose assistance this would probably have been a defeat. Hope you all enjoyed it, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.